Hello and welcome to this bonus episode of Statistically Insignificant, coming at you live from 25th century Athenian Forum, where I'm getting into an argument with a resurrected Aristotle who has picked up the woke neo-Marxist aesthetics of piercings and blue hair. Bart has been called away to more serious matters, and Dean of the show, my partner Dean, is with me instead, handing me a hardbound copy of the first volume of Das Kapital, just in case this gets more energetic. Welcome to the pod, Dean. How's it going? The sex scenes in this are incredible. <laughs> Yeah, they finally managed to work out how to do cyber sex in the real world. <laughs> I meant in the copy of Das Kapital. <laughs> well, this is the 25th century copy of Das Kapital. So. Oh, right. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In- instead of a steam loom, it's, um, well. Today, we're going to talk through a way to approach representative democracies, which is based on probability and statistics rather than electoral systems. You see, it turns out that all the people who championed the Athenian model of democracy failed to mention that they didn't elect people as liberal democracies do now. Instead, they used a system of random selection where eligible people could put themselves into a sort of lottery for various positions. The fancy name is sortition. We use it for jury duty already. They actually built some really cool devices to help random selection called, oh god, I didn't practice this one, Cleroterions? I think so. I think that's it. Well, it's Greek, so it probably sounds nothing like that. (laughs) Look, if they had written it in the Greek letters, I might be better off, but you know. (laughs) Here's a picture of a surviving one. The slots would be basically where you stuck a token representing who you are. The columns represented the local tribes. Rows would be used as an index. And there'd be some way of rolling a die for each row, which would determine whether that row was retained or discarded until they had enough people for what they needed to do. In this one, how do you know like which one of these is fucking Socrates? It would have been Socrates' token. Oh, I see the tokens are labelled. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That makes way more sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In fact... The Athenians saw elections as extremely prone to corruption by powerful interests. Aristotle actually talked about this, saying that it is accepted as democratic when public offices are filled by lot, and as oligarchic when they are filled by election. We can certainly see now- Hang on, I just want to note that, was he saying that in brackets negative or in brackets positive? Negative. Okay, because with the Greek guys, you've got to check. Yeah, look, look, he was not the Plato. He didn't think that philosopher kings were a great idea. We can certainly see now the way that money and power distort electoral politics. I don't even just mean lobbying, bankrolling electoral campaigns or whatever. Even before then, there's a filtering process, which means that the people who make it to an election as candidates, pretty bad representation of the general population, particularly when it comes to major party candidates. You really do need another system of material support if you're running an electoral campaign, and it's a huge time and effort investment, which makes it particularly inaccessible to poor people, people who have to work full time or have a lot of care responsibilities. And if you have a disability, which makes that process difficult, there's an extra barrier to entry. Or if you're playing like Valheim and it takes up a lot of your time. Mm, Such a commitment. Yes. Yes. (laughs) Iron's not going to farm itself. (laughs) There are, of course, other often very literal barriers to entry for people with disability. Like there was a federal rep here uh, in Australia Jordan Steele John, which is a sick name, by the way, Mm -hmm. who is a wheelchair user. He had to give his first speech to Parliament from the back of the room because there were steps down to the floor and he kept fucking up his hands because he would knock them on doorways trying Mm. to wheel around the place. That's a whole other discussion about accessibility infrastructure, but it will become relevant later. Realistically, in our representative democracy, we have limited choice about who is representing us. And outside of the small minority who make their way into electoral politics, direct access to the decision-making process is pretty limited. When voting, gerrymandering, electoral advertising, media power all combine to influence how people vote as well. Representatives can be prone to corruption too, from the really blatant shit like the electoral campaign donations of the US, to revolving doors between politics, lobbying, and industry, which use the establishment of interpersonal relationships to massage the political process, let's say. Yeah, and they always end up incredibly mediocre because the people in electoral politics are people who usually failed out of something else. (laughs) You get the occasional sort of freak who's in there for the love of the game, but those people should be directed to uh, a door that's marked like snacks and leads to a wood chipper. (laughs) If you're taking a demographic approach, you can quite directly see that the parliament does not reflect the population. I don't think demographics are destiny, but the prevalence of white, rich, straight, cis dudes does limit the perspectives that are attached to positions of power. Australia's had a couple of interesting case studies to counter that in the the past decade. Three of them, in particular, that spring to my mind. 
Ricky Meyer, who was a uh, senator elected in Western Australia, I think it was, he came in as this tiny, like, f- something four-wheel drive uh, interest party. I shit you not. And basically what happened is that through preference finagling, he wound up getting just enough of the vote to be a senator. And he's the kangaroo poo guy. He's the kangaroo poo guy for those who uh, want to look him up, actually. But really importantly... He got in there and suddenly realized that he was completely out of his depth. Like, he didn't really understand the process of policy making, all that sort of thing. He didn't quite understand what policies were trying to do. But in response to that, he started listening to public servants. He started assessing policies based on their merits, not based on the party that they came from, which was quite revelatory in some respects. Now, let me be clear. Don't agree with the guy of many things. But I think it is interesting to have somebody in there who made decisions on policy, not along party lines. Second example is Jackie Lambie, who is a little bit more uh, successful, I suppose, as a politician in the sense that she came to Parliament through similar preference deals, but has actually stuck around. She has some unfortunate ideas about things like immigration, but she has been a single mum living on welfare and was able to stand up in the Senate and talk about that experience when trying to change the way that our welfare system works. You can take the fuck yep. out of the thing, but you can't take the thing. <laughs> you can take the fuck out of the thing. But you take the fuck out of the thing, but you can't take the thing out of the fuck. That's right. the thing I'm getting to. Yep. You can't. People's people's positions and experience do inform their politics. Yes. It works both ways. It means that someone like Jackie Lambie does actually come in with some uh, based takes, I believe the children are saying. <laughs> yes, and also some um, – what's the opposite of based? Uh, cringe. Cringe. Okay, some cringe takes as well, yes. But as opposed to somebody who came out of, like, TIGS and uh, all their friends went to – Private grammar schools, yeah. Exactly, exactly. And then uh, went – or all went into politics, whose only position is cringe. Yes. Their background is, is cringe. They were put in horrible little shorts and they remain there psychologically until the day they die. Yeah. Yeah. The third example is actually a recent Greens member elected in Brisbane, the new woke capital of the country, who did not expect to get elected, quite obviously, in the sense that uh, not only did he not have a hell of a lot of funding for the campaign, nobody expected a, a Queensland to elect Greens representatives, and he actually had to finish up a couple of shifts at his retail job before he took up the representative position because he just didn't have enough money to pay rent (laughs) for the first month before he got his first representative paycheck. And, I mean, look, solidarity, brother. (laughs) That is – that's a real direct democracy when you can, like, I don't know, complain directly to the manager who is a senator. (laughs) Well, no, no, he was in the House of Reps. Oh, all right then. So he's writing policy. Oh, far more interesting. Ah, Yeah, yeah, yeah. I have, of course, completely forgotten his name. Anyway – If we follow the democracy is the worst form of governance, except for all the others, approach, it's worth thinking about what it is that makes democracy a good way of organizing things. Machiavelli actually had some interesting things to say about this, which might surprise people who have only read or heard of The Prince. See, that was written for the rulers of principalities, the princes, right? But Machiavelli was fundamentally more of a practical person looking at ways of governing different states. He saw principalities as an inherently suboptimal and unstable situation because the power structure is limited by and from the population. Your typical peasant may see little difference between one lord and the next, or may see it as beneficial to overthrow a local ruling class that's treating them like shit. He wrote another book called The Discourses, which is about the Italian Republic states, how to organize a republic. If I can just comment, I don't think Machiavelli ever like really speaks about peasant uprisings I don't think he like animates them with particular political will. Just so much if they get angry, they will cause disruption, <laughs> which he hates. Yes. To Machiavelli, a republic is fundamentally better in part because people have reason to support the state if they feel like they have a stake in it. This is worth preserving to him. As another interesting historical note, during the Enlightenment, where our modern liberal democracies were really constructed, different democratic systems from Greece were actually looked at, including sortition. But sortition was dismissed by all but a handful of the political theorists at the time. It's not entirely clear why. Some historians and theorists have suggested that logistic barriers might come into play, because while the sortition system with a machine like this is relatively easy to do, If you have a small local population, if we're looking at the population of somewhere like England or America, the logistics of having everybody option to sign up for it 
very difficult. It may also be that it runs counter to ideas of political consent because the population doesn't actually choose those representatives in a, directly at a sortition system. Whereas if in an electoral system, at some point, the people make a choice, theoretically. Or maybe it would be too inclined to put random undesirables into positions of considerable power and these upper class people couldn't be having that. I think they were really obsessed with the idea that... Um political ability, your leadership and governance was some intangible but very active force mm. that was essential to the running of the state. Like the idea of having something banal as sortition really undercut, I think, this ideological obsession with this new democratic form. Well, I do think that there is like, an undercurrent there of there are people who are suited to rule. They may arise from the lower classes, but they were perhaps less inclined to do so. And they saw electoral systems as a way to filter that. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Sortition yeah. would be would fly in the face of their their ability to sort of harvest this crop of supermen or whatever. <laughs> yeah, well, no small amount of eugenics arose out of those ideas as well, of course. Thankfully, because people breed, you can just uh, keep electing the people who are the children of the previous rulers, which means you never lose any that's of that right. efficacy. Yeah, 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 absolutely. You preserve it. Another strength of democracy to me is that people fundamentally know what they need to live, and they should be able to assert those needs through the state. In this way, having a democratic system is actually more efficient than some philosopher king asshole who thinks I know what the plebs should have. Everyone should be able to have their bins collected in a time and a manner that suits them, is what I'm really getting at here. But personally, I don't want to spend all my time fucking around with policy decisions. Mm. That is for worse nerds than me, and the kind of cooked units who get really into student politics, they can do that. So to my eye, some sort of representative system is better than any of the direct democracy proposals I've seen, because I don't want to have to read a shitload of stuff about every policy decision that's coming up and then vote on them. I do not have the time to do that. We and should have people for that. Yeah, it's the, the classic Zizek line that, you know, alienation is not a dirty word. <laughs> want to be alienated. I want my shit at arm's length. Yeah. Of course, if you're looking to incorporate sortition into your government system, you don't have to have every position filled by it. And you will really need a robust system of public servants to give good advice, good structures to prevent and investigate corruption, and some way of supporting people after their terms are complete. I do genuinely think that something like having half the Senate seats filled by sortition would radically change an election-based democracy for the better, even if you don't have people selected by sortition actually writing legislation. Can I make the... Sorry, can I, can I take us on a bit of a tangent? Oh, go on. Let's say you, 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 you have sortitioned. We've done it. We've sortitioned. We have sorted. <laughs> what is the, the past term? Past tense? Uh, sortition. Probably something in Greek. Sortiated? <laughs> Ex excoriated, of yeah, course. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Once you've excoriated a bunch of politicians. That sounds great. Mm. You, are, you have these people in this position and they are working away. The public service has a lot of power there to set the terms of how these people behave. Um, the information what, that they get. Yeah. The information they get, the decisions they are presented with. You know, you just look at, at, at Trump's term. Yes. All these stories of people putting three pieces of paper in front of him and very deliberately not putting end the world on any of them. Yes. <laughs> like just sort of yeah. channeling the political will of the people in that power. How are these public servants managed yeah, I don't have a good answer for that. Mm. I think it is something that's really, really important. Um, and there needs to be like accountability and transparency and all this sort of thing. And another thing that I think feeds into that broadly across a society, if you have this, is all of a sudden your education system needs to be a shitload better than it is. Because if any one of these plebs could wind up making decisions in a governmental position, well, they really need to have a level of education which would allow that. I'm much more of a cynic. I, I hear you say that and I say that would be the re reason that a sortition is a non-starter. <laughs> people say, people are stupid. You would might say, well, we could make them not stupid with education. They say, oh, we can't afford that, so we can't afford sortition. Well, no, I, I, I think the happen. argument goes the other way, which is look at the people we have making those decisions now. And that's what I'm saying. But those they are not making right. decisions are not going to be uh, enacting sortition. Sorry to be a downer. No, no, no. I, this is not a proposal for how we get there. Right? That's true. This is a proposal for what it would look like. I mean, Australia has a bunch of people who are like really enthusiastic about putting sortition into our Australian system, right? They are exactly the same kind of weird nerds as the Australian Republicans. Or train freaks. No, 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 no. Train freaks are wholesome. Train freaks are not like this. Okay, so sortition people are not wholesome. I think they are slightly more wholesome than like the uh, monarchists. But there is a type of person who winds up in these groups. Right. Okay. Yeah. And that's why I am your guest and not one of these sortition freaks. <laughs>
Yes. Also, it's Christmas Day and nobody's going to want to talk to me on Christmas Day except you. Well. I mean, you you kind of want to talk to me on Christmas Day because I might bring you something, but, you know. I was playing with the cat and now I'm I'm talking about sortition into a microphone. It's a serious downgrade to my standard of living. But you volunteered. We pushed through it. We'll have to have fun and talk about something interesting. Oh, yeah. Public service. Yes. And those people being sort of manipulative in a sort of yes minister fashion. Yeah. Um. I can cut out silence, don't worry. Yeah, do. <laughs> I might not cut out that bit. Though. No! <laughs> All right. Now that we've talked a bit about what sortition is, I want to talk about the statistical perspective on it because, you know, that's what I'm here for. Yeah. Is there any statistics? Isn't it just you, you roll a dice? Oh, boy, I have some real bad news for you about what is involved in rolling dice. It's going to take more than 15 minutes, isn't it? <laughs> I didn't tell you it would take less. <laughs> That's true. You, you never lied. <laughs> I never I never lied. So from a statistical perspective, there are kind of two big questions in sortition. Who can be selected, which is what we call a sampling frame. Same term as you use for any survey, basically. And how do you select from that sampling frame? Why is it called frame? Data frame. I don't, I don't know where that came from originally, but... Because like, I can understand if it was called the sample. No, the sample is what you get out after you've done the selection. Oh, okay. So it's yeah. the frame from which the sample is taken. Torn. Yes. Okay. All right. This is your uh, random selection. And is it random? Is that yes. a trick question? Okay. R- random can be more than just everyone has an equal chance. We'll talk about that in just a second. I really want to talk about the sampling frame first, because it's a bit like asking who has the right to vote, but kind of more so, because you really do create two classes of people if you have some people in your population who can be selected and some who cannot. Yeah, you would have a one class and then a second class of people. Yes, indeed. Yeah, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. They're not exactly the same. As we say, they represent different accesses to systems of power. And we already treat access to voting rights as distinct from being acce- from access to being elected to parliament. It is important to distinguish parliamentary candidature and electoral system from sortition candidature under this system. There will be people you want to exclude, however. Where that boundary lies basically comes down to you have to talk about it, you have to work it out for the specific population that you are looking at. We have some ideas, uh, but they may or may not get (laughs) buy-in. Let's just put it that way. Here are some of the criteria that might be proposed. The first one is age. Usually you would have a minimum age so you don't get some 12-year-old sitting in parliament because frankly, I don't think that would be very good for the 12-year-old. But given the absurd number of incredibly old and clearly fading people in the US government, some people have actually proposed a maximum age as well. I would say this feeds into number two on my list, and I am not entirely sure if a maximum age is a good idea because there's so much variability in how people age and their capacity as they age, but it is certainly something that has come up in discussions about representatives and things like this. Number two on my list is disability. This is in some respects the thorniest question here. We don't currently have universal suffrage in Australia, for example, because there are people with disabilities who are not allowed to vote. Current legislation puts the threshold at a person who, by reason of being of unsound mind, is incapable of understanding the nature and significance of enrollment and voting. Disability rights advocates have long argued against this system. For example, people with disability Australia point to this being a really vague sort of statement, and it's used to limit a person's ability to exercise their rights, often because doing so, like having somebody able to go and vote, is inconvenient for the very limited support systems available to people with disabilities. Going to a polling place may be difficult. Filling out a... uh, Ballot. Ballot. Thank you. Yes. Yes, I'm not the only one who fucked up. You have to leave that in. You have to leave that in. Fine, fine, okay. Filling out a ballot may be physically difficult or you may need assistance to do that. These things become a real barrier, even in our electoral system, and would become more of a barrier, I think, if we attempt to introduce sortition with the existing way we deal with people who have disabilities. As an aside, when I was 15, I earnestly argued that women being able to vote was a mistake because it was called universal suffrage and was therefore a bad thing. (laughs) And then I thought to myself, that means because it's annoying to go to the polling place, you don't have to go if you don't have to vote. So therefore, you know, just leave it to the guys because that just wouldn't annoy more people. This was not like an ironic opinion. (laughs) I was just, just really dumb. Mm, yeah, it happens. It, it continues to happen, in fact. I wasn't gonna. I wasn't gonna go that far. But, yeah. <laughs> I actually. Sorry, I'm interrupting you. 
Um, oh no, it's almost like I wanted you on the show to talk okay. occasionally. Yeah. I think there's kind of a, a distinction between the, I mean, you've put age and disability as different, but fundamentally as somebody ages, they develop. Become disabled. They bec- yeah, de- yeah, yeah, absolutely. Develop a disability. But there's a distinction between the universal disability of decline as you age, which I think affects people to more or less degree, but everyone, you know, everyone falls off. Everyone comes to infirmity at some point. Precisely. Yeah. Whereas the disability of, say, a developmental disorder, uh, that is... An intellectual impairment, inter- which is kind of the big one that crops up with these. Yeah, and they, these these things are still normal. These happen to normal people. There's a normal thing that happens to have a disability. It's something that I don't think people really consider that way because, hey, it never happened to me, so it's abnormal to my experience, but it is a very human thing mm. to be disabled. I think it's troubling to make a distinction between age and disability because, like you, you said when we are talking about age, right, that you do, don't know if you necessarily wanted a maximum age because people's Abil- uh, yeah, 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 ability is quite variable. Well, I see the age as more of a minimum. Yeah, yeah, I, I get that. But what you said about that is that if you said everyone who falls into this particular classification of disability, yes, people with the same name for their disability have a wide range of ability. Oh yeah, absolutely. And this is why, like, the the principle that I would put forward for like deciding whether or not a particular person is eligible is for one. Should they be put into the uh, sortition position, they should be given as much support as it is physically or logistically possible to do. They should be given, if they need it, additional time to understand legislation and things like that, if they have the need for it, for whatever reason. That is very, very different to slapping someone in there and saying, we will give you the same resources as an able-bodied person. Beyond that, if you are going to set thresholds, People with disabilities should be the ones to make those decisions. People with disabilities should be at the forefront of that kind of a process because they have a lived experience. The basic principle is nothing about us without us. It should not be able-bodied people deciding what the threshold of capacity is for people with disabilities. That just encodes discrimination. It encodes all of the assumptions that able-bodied people have about what it's like to live with a disability. This motherfucker said (laughs) able-bodied. I think we cross wires here a little, right? Because we're talking about the sampling frame, which sounds like a particular, particularly boring statistical warframe. <laughs> um, and that's a question of who gets to be in those cool little Aristotelian slots, right? Yeah. Whereas you're talking about if you bang someone in there, there's a question of do you get to be on the lot or does the, the assessment of your ability happen after you've done the draw? So that's kind of a technical distinction without a difference, I guess. I mean, I I think it would be fair to say, put someone on the frame, if they get selected, then there is assessment because you can't go, you don't have the logistics, uh, the the resources to go out and assess every single person before they get on there. I think there is an argument there. That's what I'm saying. It's like, I think there is a distinction without a difference because if you, say, exclude somebody from the sampling frame, that is not feasible to do in any way other than like demographic signalers. Mm, yeah. Or say somebody has this particular condition, which as we said, even within people within the same condition is so widely variable. Whereas once you've done the selection, you've got your 200 um, people who are there to, to suffer, then <laughs> yes. you can assess them, you know, you have infinitely yeah. more resources yeah. to sort of assess and support them uh, as opposed to, you know, just kicking everybody who uh, falls below a particular level of, of capacity to some other selection uh, criteria, which is already ableist as fuck. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know, it's just, just sort of systemically ruined from the outset. Yeah. I, I think that, like, that's kind of a... Excluding someone after the fact is a bit like... Well, to my eyes, is kind of indistinguishable from excluding them ahead of time, except it takes a little bit longer to get there. But where that assessment happens, at some point it would need to happen. Yeah, but I'm just saying it's not feasible to do... Before time, yeah, yeah. Before time. It's not feasible to do the assessment well. Yes, for everybody ahead of time. Yeah, absolutely. How many Australians? Like Uh, There's something like 25 25 million at the moment. Oh, fuck. That's total population. Yeah, well, it's much harder to do that than for 200 chuckle fucks. (laughs) Yes. In general, though, I do think it's important to maximise the number of people who have access in this regard. 
that will mean a lot more resources, a lot more energy and time and effort that goes into the care and the support of people with disabilities in general, because that will help more of them be in a position where they can come and represent themselves in a sortition system. But also, if they are selected into a sortition system, finding out a way to maximize their access to it, it takes time, it takes effort, and it is an investment in the community that needs to happen. The next thing on my list is citizenship. And this is one that Australia has a bit of a fraught history with, given the clusterfuck of dual citizenship exclusions for parliamentary reps that have happened in the past few years. So if you're not Australian and you haven't encountered this, Australia has a law on the books which says that somebody cannot run in an election or be elected to parliament if they are a dual citizen. With anywhere. Doesn't matter how they got that dual citizenship, like a lot of countries will do it automatically if your parents come from a country of origin. If that's you, you can be excluded even though you've never been there, even though you have not accessed any of the rewards of that citizenship. This has been used to, uh, well, it, it was based off of racism, shockingly, I know in Australia, but it has like descended into basically a bureaucratic mess. It would be extremely funny for somewhere like North Korea to just decide to fuck with Australians parliamentary system by declaring that anybody elected to a parliamentary position in Australia gets automatic North Korean citizenship. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I, I'd also, just as, a, as an aside, that you say this started with racism, but this is preventing Australians from being governed by British people. And so yeah, is but it really that bad? It didn't stop Tony Abbott. That's true. Yeah. So it's ineffective. All right, well, in that case, I've, I've lost all faith in this system. But we need some way to prevent British people from being sortition. Mm. That's, that's, that's hard. A, that's a joke. That's, that's a, oh, no, you were saying it's hard, not that it was bad. Okay, that's good. I don't have to. Sort of <laughs> well, I mean, look, unless, unless you were going to write an explicit exclusion of British people, which I, I'm not necessarily opposed to, but. It's difficult to do. They're, they're tricky. One could be in The your wily home. Brit, yes. Yeah, one could be in your home right now. Mm, yes. You, you'd never know. Yeah, it's true. Mm. Yep. Anyway, what were you saying? Even if people aren't citizens when they live in a country, they will pay taxes, they're affected by policy decisions, they have a material interest in the outcome of politics, and they, I think, should have a say, to some extent, in what those political decisions look like. In Aotearoa, New Zealand, permanent residents can vote, not just citizens. So if you have a system that combines elections and sortition, you could have something like a citizenship requirement for sortition, but some sort of residency requirement for voting, which would allow you to give some political power to people who are not strictly citizens. Or you could extend sortition to permanent residents as well. Not that Australians would be necessarily very willing to do that, of course. Next up, and another thorny issue, is the question of character. All I'm going to say is uh, I don't think wizards should be allowed to be on the sortition train. No, you no. don't want um, various sort We don't of, want those fucking nerds. You don't want various fae, uh, goblins, various sort of background options should probably be disabled. Yeah. Uh, possessed by a dark spirit. But thankfully, um, that's all presented right there on the character sheet. So Yeah, you can just check. You can just check. Yep. Just, that's a simple data entry task. Okay, mm-hmm. what's the next point? I put the, under this banner stuff like criminal history, uh, which, I mean, look, Australia was perhaps one of the interesting examples for that, given that what we really should do is lock them all up as soon as they get elected. But separate to that, I think there are genuine questions about what it would take for someone to be excluded below the threshold of a guilty verdict at a trial. Or if they have had a trial, been found guilty, and served time for something, would they be excluded afterwards? Or would they be able to be elected to a sortition position as soon as they get out? How about while they're actually in prison? I suspect that while they are in prison would be considered a bit on the nose, although it could be very funny. Yeah, well, I mean, the the logic of prison, which I don't agree with, but is that people who are in prison are not yet rehabilitated. Yes. So... I don't necessarily think that's particularly wise, but if you're taking that as your yeah as your lodestone, then yeah, you're not going to be. I mean, the, the justice system as it currently exists is very poorly suited in so many ways to a sort of sortition filtering. Yeah, but just it, assuming we only we only get to magic sortition into existence, we don't get to fix the yeah the criminal justice system. Then yeah, peop, I mean, the logic also says that once you're out of prison, you have served your time. Well, yeah, but I also I do think that there is a question. If you've got somebody who has multiple credible accusations of sexual assault, I don't think that there is... Well, the major parties would probably be unwilling to put that person forward in an election because the media would run repeated stories about this. And there is a social filtering process for electoral candidates on those bases. In Australia, most of the time. Not all the time. 
etc., etc., right? Depending on whether or not it's known, etc. Yeah. Yeah, well, this is one of the things, but that is a threshold of evidence well below what we accept at a criminal trial. No, I agree, but of course you don't want a, a sex pest in government, but it's like the uh the discussion around do you let felons vote? in America, which is like, they're not going to vote for crimes. I don't, it would take a truly deranged individual to be a sex pest because most of those people are ignorant as to their nature. I disagree. I think most of those no, people the, the would... Serial sex pests know what they're doing. Okay. Well, I would say serial sex pests, are, I would say, uh, like you're talking about somebody with a, a pathological drive uh, or, or whether or not that's um, well, okay, if that's the... socially incepted or something, but... My point is just that regardless of someone's literal criminal pre- predilections, there's a question between do they translate that into policy decisions? Hmm. I realise I'm, I'm sort of devil's advocating here. But I don't, <laughs> just, just a I don't think it's a... Uh, well, uh, no, I, I, I mean, we can look at any kind of exploitative interest, let's put it that way in the similar context. Yeah. I do think that sexual assault is a particularly kind of thorny one because there are policy decisions about resources that go towards sexual assault cases and policies around, well, what is the threshold of consent for criminal conviction? These sorts of things are decided at the policy level. And I do think that somebody who has, shall we say, a libertarian approach to consent. Well, yeah, take it, Mac, what is the current political obsession of of cooked right-wing fuckers? It's it's child abusers. It's 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 groomers, as they say it. Yes, but their idea of what that looks like. Yeah, it's it's what I, it's what I'm saying. But literally, they yeah. they they're thinking about protect protect the children. If there's somebody with an accusation of child sexual predation, then it's not just a matter of sort of logically declaring, well, you know, this is person may or may not represent a, a threat to children through their power they wield in this position. It's just incredibly politically unpopular to be governed by such a person if that was no, especially, I mean, even if they'd gone through a prison sentence and the like. This sort of question does come up, and I don't know if there is a good way of dealing with it. Because, I, I mean, look, I'm not a legal scholar in any respect, but I am not sure what a reasonable way of doing that would look like. What do you, you're, you're a statistician, what's the uh, law of big numbers? Yeah, the law of large numbers, yeah. What Does, about it? I don't know what that law is, but I'm going to steal the term and reuse it <laughs> to suggest that across the, the, the millions and millions of Australians, these people represent a very small sum, and thus any particular character deficiency, no matter how severe, is going to be extremely underrepresented in Parliament. Yeah. So you can sort of take the gamble that, yep, we're letting in sex offenders uh, with the hope that, you know, with sortition, you're kind of trusting that the population on the whole is capable of, of acting morally and, and righteously. Mm. You're saying, if we're already making that assumption, then you make the assumption that they can do that, even if, I don't know, you know, Vlad the Impaler ends up <laughs> yes. with, a, with a sortition seat. Yeah, I do wonder, like... Is that the law of large numbers? That is not remotely the law of large numbers. Okay, well, it's a law that involves large numbers, so I just want to point out that I'm not incorrect. <laughs> I, I mean, I'm a mathematician. I can accept uh, valid and consistent redefinitions of terms. Okay, perfect. Yep. Fantastic. Occasionally. We will call it Dean's Law. <laughs> There's another kind of question around like criminal records and things is if, if somebody is automatically re-enrolled when they get out, sure, whatever. If they're not, what's the threshold for that boundary? What sort of crimes do we think are quote unquote bad enough to count against this? And my, my thinking of this is like Violet, Violet, not Violent, Violet Coco, who was a climate activist who stopped a lane of traffic for 25 minutes on the Harbour Bridge in Sydney. She has been sentenced to jail. For doing so, uh, as part of a protest for, I should you not, 25 minutes of stop traffic at a single lane on the Harbour Bridge. Is she too criminal for the rest of her life to be eligible for the sortition system if you are saying that everybody who has a criminal history is? I don't think that that would be a good idea, but that's the sort of questions that you have to answer. Of course, the absolutely batshit insane Sydney motorists who think that she should be strung up from the bridge would say absolutely she is too criminal, but they are, as mentioned, insane. But they are themselves eligible for sortition. So if enough of them get selected, she will be strung up. From it's true. It's true. Uh, and that would be, you know, that would be just and good. Uh, <laughs> you know. I would go back to Dean's Law. Yeah. Which is that you're dealing with such a huge number of people that these individual examples kind of get washed out. And I think you could get buy-in. 
I know we were kind of assuming that sortition's a thing and, and how, how would it work, but yeah. how it would work has to necessarily include how does this maintain legitimacy? Yes. And I think that the argument is is Dean's law that, you would, yeah, you might get Violet Coco, um, but you might also get your nice Nan, uh, who, I don't know. Is... Probably has some questionable opinions about gollywogs, but. Yeah. I was literally about to go right there. So she's bringing all of her uh, horrible little dolls to parliament. But, you know, she's also, she knows that her, uh, her grandson's struggling with rent and maybe might vote to support that individual who she is invested in the well-being of. So, but my point is just that the, these individual examples are kind of missing the point. Sortition's great because. It could be any bastard, which means it's very unlikely to be any bastard. (laughs) Yes. I actually have another one, which I don't think would be very well implementable, but I think it's an interesting idea to toy around with, which what if you have a wealth limit? What if you say that in my head, this would be in a system where you also have electoral politics. Somebody with enough wealth is known to have enough power, enough resources, enough political agency that they don't need sortition on top of that. I don't think it's necessarily like a great idea, but it would be interesting to see the discussion that came out of that. And in particular, I do think that once you have somebody elected to a sortition position, there should be some way of saying, right, you don't get to have assets invested in anything anymore. For the period of time that you are there, you don't get to have rental properties, you don't get to have stock or whatever else, because that will influence the decisions that you make. Again, you have to... Sortition has to be seen as legitimate and practical. Yeah. And I think that is just so inconvenient. Yeah. And you mean you mean barrier by wealth or the, the, liquidating someone's assets? So liquidating like forced investment. Yeah. Would be seen as so intrusive as to not be viable. I think that sorry, I'm gonna keep saying Dean's Law because it's just my my way of thinking about it. If you uh, have maximal Dean's Law, which is that everyone is eligible, mm. that also makes it extremely easy to implement. Whereas every attempt you make to exclude means people test. or means test, means testing sucks. Like yes. yeah. it just makes any policy not work because means testing does not work. I think that any time you means test this sampling frame, you are adding a layer of complexity which makes sortition exponentially with every layer you add less workable for people. Whereas, yeah, absolutely. I do think that there is a real benefit to making it as simple as possible. Yeah, and but then after the fact, if you want to do a wealth filter. Yeah. That has to be done after somebody is selected. And you say divestment, but um, I just, I, by, you know, what's, what's, what's the class analysis? By definition, the people who are in a position to uh, have uh, class interests that are inimicable to, you know, real people mm. are not very many in their number. Dean's Law wins again. <laughs> yes. I don't have a problem with um, having some rich asshole being sortitioned into a position of power because, in an ideal sense, that person's vote is only worth as much as... The poor bastard next to them. Exactly. Scunter. Yes. <laughs> and also, like, if we look at the current demographics in Parliament, right, the number of them who are landlords, the number of them who are millionaires is pretty fucking obscene. Exactly. Like, like any any system which selects randomly for a population for basically any random selection, except maybe one that restricts to give wealthy people higher likelihood, that's going to choose more poor people than currently are in Parliament. So I think... Any kind of sortition system will smooth over some of those class power discrepancies, regardless. Yeah, and the other you can come at it from the the entirely opposite angle, which is that if the stated problem is, what if we select somebody who's too rich? Uh, one of the things sortition might do by implementing hopefully policies parliamentarily that are uh, redistributive is you might just make the rich people less rich. That would be great, right? But yeah. then, but then yeah, you've yeah. got the problem of of how rich can you be? To yes. be sortitioned, just make people less rich and then they're less problematic. They still have their, their class position and interest. They want to get back to that heady height, but yeah, at least you're um you're taking away the situation where you've got yeah, you know, like you said, it's just it's a college of millionaires. Yes, um, who legitimately go on about how what are people complaining about the uh things have never been better because they <laughs> they just everyone they talk to says things are getting better. Yes, last one is is it mandatory or voluntary? Now, given you put this on the left side of that line. Would you, are you saying service is mandatory or voluntary, or is being on the sortition roll mandatory or voluntary? Is being in the sampling frame mandatory or voluntary? Mandatory. 
Fair enough, yeah. I think that it should be mandatory in the same way that the electoral roll is mandatory, but just as you can donkey vote, I do think that there have to be, has to be a really low threshold for somebody to say, look, I just can't do this right now. Yeah, that, that's fine. That's after the fact. Yeah, like yeah, jury yeah. duty, you can you can select yourself out. But the thing yeah, is... Yeah, but much much lower threshold than jury duty because this would be like a multiple year commitment. No, 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 I, I, I get you. But making something mandatory in the same way that making something universal lends to it a, a political legitimacy, but also a practical verve that you don't get from Vote. something where you have to opt in. You have yes. to go and register, where in which case you make, you know, you add in factors of, of class and access yep. and um, restriction. Like the classic thing is, let's say um, you have to go up to somebody and say, yes, I want to be in the sortition role. Yeah. And all of a sudden those only get put in wealthy neighborhoods. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, so I, I look at the way that um, voting stations are distributed in the US or even voting eligibility and purging of voting rolls and all this sort of thing as, as a, a means of voter suppression. Mandatory voting gets rid of all of that. Precisely, yeah. Like Amer- I speak with American friends and if you are American, my uh, condolences. Condolences, yeah. <laughs> um, about saying, you know, mandatory voting is an imposition on you know, your freedoms, it's an imposition on your time, you know, what if you don't want to... And there's a legitimate question of what if you don't consent to being a consenting member of a the society. political process? Yeah. yeah, if you say, no, there's no there's no good option, making me vote for one is um, is atrocious. Well, A, like you said, you can donkey vote, and oh, and I do. <laughs> I know, I know. Uh, well, what was it you wrote on your last uh, Senate? Uh, that would be hang the cunts. <laughs> yes. And just I had little arrows pointing to uh, particular individuals. Making it mandatory... It is indeed an imposition on your freedom, but I'd say it it's the lesser of two evils, or rather it's just if you want to maximize your freedoms, yes, making a- it mandatory, it makes it very difficult to exclude you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, this is a this is a setting in which a positive freedom, in, in the sense of you are able to do something, you are supported in doing something, outweighs a negative freedom, which is you have been told you have to be on this. Yeah. Now imagining a policeman shooting a black man in America because he did not vote. <laughs> Which is <laughs> horrendous. <laughs> <laughs> it's LAPD. a special kind of hell, yes. Yeah, the LAPD has opened up whole new forms of, <laughs> of violence against black people. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, like if, like you say, the negative freedom, and I think it, it it precludes exclusion along a lot of lines if you make it mandatory, which is why I think that, you know, what we're talking about, disability, citizenship, and all these other things... If it is mandatory, you uh, eliminate the state's capacity to exclude people pejoratively, or, yeah, or, or yeah, yeah, in a predatory or, or, I don't know if pejoratively is the word. You limit the state's ability to exclude people, and then you need these other frameworks that, like, like citizenship. I think citizenship and ability would become the big boundaries because those are the ways. I mean, ability is kind of harder to classify people into being disabled if they are able-bodied in order to exclude them. I mean, that would just be a matter of paternalistic, oh, we don't think that people with disabilities really have the capacity to make these decisions for themselves sort of thing. Citizenship would be the big one because you can pick entire classes of people, if you're a fascist, let's say people of colour, and just say they are non-citizens now. I mean, this is something that Israel does in order to, it claims to be a democracy, but like it excludes so many Palestinian people from voting Mm, by via citizenship. So it's a democracy with a very restricted citizenship and that is one of the ways that enforces the kind of apartheid system there. But I think this this is not a necessarily a problem with sortition. No, this is a problem to... more generally with any yeah, system yeah. where you have like cl- a, a class who have access to power and a class who do not. I was going to go back a second about disability because you would you would get the I could see a form of prejudice where yep you let everybody be sorticianed. And if somebody gets in there who uh, is perceived to have a lack of ability, yeah. rather than making an effort, you know, you have ritualized forms of kind of forcing them to uh, recuse themselves from the process. Yes, absolutely. Sort of thing. But Dean's Law, baby, it, it, it never fails. <laughs> you can have somebody in a sortition seat because the, the number of Australians who genuinely have an ability not commensurate to the task of participating in Parliament which I think is pretty low. Yes. You could have somebody on that serving the entire term without necessarily disrupting the legitimacy of, of Parliament. Yes, I do. And you could have a handful of such people whose votes become erratic. Uh, and I, I mean erratic in, this, in the sense of like um, they're not typical. I don't mean they necessarily mean these people are just picking randomly. You could have people sortitioned who we don't see, and I, I would say see presently, 
as able to participate. Yeah. Have them continue to participate without necessarily undermining the results of that electoral session. Uh, now that I say that, though, if those are the swing votes, then you would get a lot of people saying, you know, how do we... In my head, because of the way that opinions actually exist in your general population, and they are not nearly as close split as your typical party politics, right? Well, they, you know, they're designed to form yeah. extremely narrow margins. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Whereas people who, like, if, if we look at, like, universal healthcare, that has a massive level of support in the general population. Yeah. It's just that the the finagling of party politics is such that the way it manifests in our electoral system has a very, very thin margin because it's voted on by people who have interest and so on and so on and so on. One thing that we will get to is the um, minority and marginalized groups, whether or not they can be well represented in this system. And I do think there is a question there. So I don't think this is a solution for everything. I'm sorry, Dean's Law does not cover this. I know. Yeah. Dean's Law cannot fail. It can only be failed. <laughs> But like when it comes to disability, I do think that there are people for whom like so so the example I am thinking of is somebody the daughter daughter no son of somebody I knew a long time ago he died uh, relatively young he had a combination of different disabilities including an intellectual impairment physical impairment and all this sort of thing and he was nonverbal like in the sense that he did not understand language and had never learned language and things mm. like that was also quite inclined to become very distressed and overwhelmed if he was in a loud environment the these sorts of things mean that here is somebody who re realistically could not have advocated for themselves yeah. And I think to put somebody like that in a position where you are wheeling them into parliament, mm. that's not good for them. No. But the people who should make that decision is not me sitting here, you know, like like the statistician picking numbers or whatever. It's the people who actually understand that experience well and like can make that decision on an individual basis. Well, we go back to what I was saying, you know, how do you trust the public service who is enabling these people? I think that you're placing a lot of trust in them to make that determination. And are those, like you say, no decision about us without us yeah, is, yeah, the, yeah. is the slogan. How do you determine, you know, who are the disabled people who are involved in that? Disability advocates, disability ad activists have had organizations to better represent their interests and even the interests of people who are like intellectually impaired. And I think there are frameworks within that which would allow you to maximize access a lot better than what we do at the moment. It doesn't have to be perfect to be a shitload better than it is. Yeah. And I think that if you put the foremost principle of that system as being providing a maximal a maximal level of care and a maximal level of support, you radically change the approach that institutions take to these situations when that is their mandate, yeah. as opposed to what it currently is, which is, oh, all people with disabilities are just whiners who are faking it, who don't actually need all the support or don't deserve the support. And thus, you know, funding is cut, access is cut. The, the money and the resources are not put there yeah, to no, make that it's, possible. It's, it would be a thousand times better than what's there now. And I suppose... The act of doing it would reveal new opportunities and and options to to support these people to allow them to participate. Yeah, absolutely. And yeah, I I um I think I mentioned this yesterday when we we were discussing this a little bit, which is that uh, spoilers. We did in fact talk a little beforehand. Yeah, I know. Sorry, I've I've, I've come in with um. With some, <laughs> You're ruining with, the cafe with, with some pregame. Um, <laughs> the I think the important thing is to give them the chance. Yes, because. You don't know somebody's ability, what it is in a particular context. Yeah, yeah. So a diagnosis is not a destiny here. And no, I, exactly. But yeah, and I well want to be that... really clear that chance does not look like what we currently think of as opportunity, which is not to say you throw somebody in there and hand them exactly the same thing as you would give to the able-bodied person, because no, that exactly. is not that actual genuine chance. Well, I mean, it, it's, it goes inversely as well. You might get people who society would label as entirely abled, mm. who when you put them in the context of the parliamentary thing, just fucking lose their minds. Yes. Like I know people with anxiety who simply could not handle that. Yes. I mean they, they I, I would argue that in this context anxiety would be a disability. I was gonna say, but society yeah. doesn't doesn't treat those people no. as disabled in the same way. Yes. Yeah, yeah. It but like, no, that, that's, it's definitely an impairment to your ability to do things. Well, but from the social model of disability, I would say that the disability is that they have been put in an environment which is 
antithetical to the way that they function. Right, but I'm saying that what your dad says is, what, my son's just a bit stressed. He doesn't have a disability. Or... Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that is a different... So the disability in this context is the experience of the person's... That, 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 not, that's what not I'm, the that's classification. What I'm is yeah, that, yeah. Is it people that society generally might not perceive as having a disability, you put them in that context, they all of a sudden... Yeah, their experience is shit. Yes. shit. Whereas you might say, if you did take somebody who society had written off mm. and put them in a context where they are financially and housing secure, they have support that they've been denied their entire life, you might say, oh crap, this person is, is actually uh, entirely capable of participating and in fact giving really insightful commentary about the shit situation that they've just come from. Yeah, I, one of the biggest things that I think goes under-reflected in this is just how many people have disabilities on some scale. Yeah. And, like, in Australia, for example, being... I mean, I I have a disability in the sense that I have a physical impairment, injury to my lower back, arthritis, so on and so forth, which means that I am... My, my mobility is limited. It's not too bad. I mean, I don't have a disability classification or anything like that, but it is a disability in that it reduces my ability to interact with the world. And I always surprise myself by thinking that it probably is a disability to have no sense of smell. Yeah. Like I am I am a nosmic, which means I was, was born without a sense of smell. Yeah. I don't... I don't know if this term is probably horrible, but I don't feel disabled, if you know what I mean. Well, no, no, but I get it. I mean, so the, the social theory of disability again, right? The impairment yeah, yeah, yeah. is the physical limitation. Oh, that's what I mean. I'm not... I'm not a, yeah, a, well, I, I think of my, my favourite example for this, which I'm pretty sure I've mentioned on the pod before, is that I see being short-sighted, and I am quite short-sighted, as an impairment but not a disability. Mm. Because I put glasses on and nothing fucking matters, right? It's it's equivalent, right? There are people who are sight-impaired, but that is at a higher threshold than me. Whereas somebody who is left-handed, that's not an impairment. They are every bit as dexterous. It's just a, a question of what is their pro- like dominant hand. Whereas I would call that a disability because the world is built for right-handed people. That is, I think, a really important distinction to make there. Yeah, and I wouldn't call being a nosebag a disability because I can carry out the stinky cat poo. <laughs> yes, it's with, true. With, with no ill effects, so... Yeah. Yeah, you're not the one who suffers if you don't shower. That's true. <laughs> I'm not the one who suffers at all, and that's the end of the discussion. So. Yes, exactly. We got a little bit distracted from that, but in terms... Yeah, we haven't talked about any statistics. Where's the statistics? I have bad news for you about how general likely I classify statistics. Oh, crap. Have we been doing maths? Not quite. We've been doing stats. Thank God. Yeah, yeah. Now now we're going to do the maths. (laughs) No! (laughs) I would just say, I don't know if we actually summed up, which is that uh, the the official Dean's Law position... (laughs) Is that everyone is get is sortitioned, and then afterwards you make determinations about ability and eligibility once you've been selected. Because if you do it any other way, it just becomes rife for exclusion and yes, and other things. And I think that's sort of you know I have to solve sortition. I'll just let everybody know. <laughs> All these scholars, I hope they've um, been listening because yeah, I've uh, I figured it out. But to me, it's just like if if you're going to talk about this as a, as a matter of policy, mm. you can't you can't go um uh, kicking people out before they've even managed to. No, it, a, it's a crack it's, at the, at the system. The, logistically, it is much harder to filter ahead of sort of selection. Yeah, yeah. All right, now we need to talk about the selection process. This is the maths. I'm sorry, this is oh. sampling theory stuff. Actually, no. Sorry, I'm going to stop us once again. Okay. To go back to, I actually have, I work with databases, and I just point out that the sampling frame has a whole bunch of implicit biases based on how you like store the sortition list. What do you mean? Uh, if you have a name, if you are an Australian citizen and your name is in a format that doesn't particularly well fit into, like, the first name, last name category... Okay, but you don't have to store it like that. Okay, but you don't have to store it like that. Yeah, yeah. Um, will be written on my fucking grave. <laughs> on mine too, actually. You'd be amazed how much of statistics is basically, okay, I know you've got your data in this format. It needs to not be in that format. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We were just talking about all these high-minded ideals about who gets to be yeah, yeah. on the statistics. But... The biases and exclusions that come from poorly implemented technology Mm. are horrendous. I think we should go... What I'm trying to say is we need to make one of those Greek rocks (laughs) with 25 million little holes in it. And that's that's uh, that's my official recommendation. Well, no. So um, ways that you can make that more consistent are instead of having first name, last name, you just have a string, a single string for the name. Yeah, but uh, just saying, you're, you're solving these problems. Yeah. Do we trust that those problems would be solved if this system was to be implemented in Australia. 
Um, I'm just it saying... Dep- it depends on who you get to implement it. I Genuinely, the Australian Electoral Commission is pretty good. That's that's fine. I'm just saying that these are problems. And if oh, yeah, to, yeah. The logistics of this. If um, you want to talk about discrimination of disabled people, yeah, I think that you can't discount the way that electronic systems are not great at handling people. Yes, absolutely. Anyway, sorry, I just wanted to go to that because, uh, yeah, that's my first thought. Is that If this was a database of... He's nerding out. If this was the database of the company I work for or worked for, then, yeah, I would not um, trust that to uh, sort socks. Yes, but there's a much higher threshold required from this that the Australian Electoral Commission has to ma- meet than the company that you work for. I get that. I'm yeah. just... I'm yeah, just... yeah, no, no, it's 100% a concern. I mean, the security of this system, the security of the random selection mm. using pseudo-random numbers, to be perfectly honest, you can introduce more randomness if you want, but it's it will be at some level a pseudo-random algorithm. Yeah. That's a very genuine question. And this is where, like, transparency of the system, accountability, and access of people to what is happening... So making it as simple as possible to understand, you can get very statistically fancy, and we'll talk about it in a second. Please but, do. But in general, like all of these kind of surrounding infrastructure needs to be done in such a way that there is buy-in, which means it needs to be maximally transparent, maximally engaging, mm. and maximally comprehensible, which also will require that people have enough of an understanding of statistics through their education that they can recognize what it's doing. Or that it's presented in such a way as to make the understanding of statistics implicit. Well, no, I want to make it explicit. Well, I would just say that let's say you are somebody who is not invested in politics and you don't, you cannot summon the energy, and I'm speaking of myself here, <laughs> to bother to learn how anything works. The information needs to be presented in such a way that it is not misleading on the face of it. Yes, yeah. For people but that like is that. explicit, not implicit. I don't know. If you, I would say if you make a cool enough graph. <laughs> You can imply something to somebody that they don't consciously digest. Oh, so you mean a lighter student? Yeah. A lighter population? A lighter citizens? <laughs> I think lies, lie has been unfairly maligned as a <laughs> Sorry, go, go ahead. Let's talk some... some Sampling theory? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I said yes to that. I consent to being talked at regarding uh, selection theory. I know your brain's going to slide off in this about 30 oh, seconds. Oh, like water off a duck. Yep. <laughs> The, the random selection is basically a statistical question of probability. You have all of these different people in your sampling frame. Who gets picked out of that sampling frame? There are actually multiple ways of doing this. We're going to go through some of them from simplest to more complex. I think that there are arguments for each one. It'll be very clear which I think is probably the best way to go. The first and simplest method is called a simple random sample. SRS. Yep. This gives each person an equal chance of being selected and most closely aligns with what people think of when they hear at random. In order to avoid the same person being chosen twice in a single round, you can make it without replacement, which basically means that you can only select a person once. So this becomes simple random sample without replacement. When you've made every selection that you make, I don't know if there's a better term than selection. Sample. So every time you make you take a you take, take a, a sample yeah. take a sample that means that if you're doing without replacement then all subsequent draws are not blind to the previous ones they're infected by the information from each sample you've done taking a sample without replacement just means that you can't take any individual twice if you take another sample you reset okay so what you're suggesting is if you've got a big bucket you're grabbing a handful and looking at all of them and you necessarily can't have repeats because yeah yeah the, each one is unique hand. you're not Picking one out, looking at it, putting it back in, mixing it up, picking another one out. Okay, yeah. yeah. Noted. Okay. Yes. So, uh, I learned. You did. Yay! Fuck. <laughs> As specified here, there's actually nothing preventing everyone selected in a given round coming from the same area or being from the same demographic or whatever. So if you don't want you and all of your neighbours, we can introduce what's called a stratified sample. Does not... I don't know, the law of big numbers suggests that it's impossible for everyone to come from... Not impossible. Okay. <laughs> okay, I mean, technically. Well, no, the the actual way of thinking about it is that you are more likely than you might expect to see multiple people from the same area. Mm-hmm. Like, if you've got... Say, let's... Oh, God, this is going to be me doing arithmetic on the fly, which always goes bad. But okay, if we've got... 
25 million people in the general population, let's say, what, 6 million people in Sydney. So if you've got a suburb in Sydney with a million people, right, then it would be a million people would be roughly 4% of the population. So you expect roughly 4% of your sortition positions to come from that area of a million people, Mm -hmm. right? But the chance of only 4% of, of that sortition coming from that sample is not actually... Uh, you know, equally distributed. You may well see 10% come from that area. So what you're saying is that we could potentially see the Great Newcastle Forum of 2063 or something. Yes. Which would usher in a golden age. Well, yes, but, you know, we can't be having that. That's true. Okay, yeah. fair enough. So you can stratify by geography, which is basically what we have in the election system because you have an electorate. You have a region runs in an election and somebody is elected by that region. That population has a representative. In this context, I don't think it would be a bad idea to basically say, well, if we're going to run sortition alongside democracy, for each electorate, you get one elected representative and one sortition representative. But electorates are problematic in their own right. Oh, yes. I think Australia does it better than somewhere like the US because the the um, Electoral Commission is genuinely independent. And there are principles of how they draw the boundaries on electorates, which are considerably better than the way that you get gerrymandered bullshit in the US. There, there will be another episode at some point about gerrymandering, mm. but you can build a reasonable representation, let's say. I mean, there's no such thing as a perfect one, but a reasonable representation on the basis of these electorates. The gerrymander would be a good encounter in a Dungeons and Dragons game. <laughs> Not Pathfinder? I mean, I was just sort of going the generic term for yeah, the yeah. listener, but um, I would, of course, be playing Pathfinder, yes. Talk to me, because I'm dumb here. When we were talking about the SRS and the SRSWR, yep. right, I had to think about it in terms of taking a handful from a bucket because yes. I am um, dumb. With the stratified example for geography, what does that look like if you're doing it as taking things from a bucket? Okay, so instead of having a big bucket for the entire population, you have a bucket for each electorate. Uh huh. And they have some number of things pulled out of each individual bucket. Okay, and that all happens at the same time. Yeah, so you guarantee that you will get some number from each group, from each bucket. This seems an inelegant solution. In what sense? Like, one thing, you can gerrymander it. The, the density of people is not consistent within those... No, so the way that the Electoral Commission draws boundaries here is they are enclose roughly the same number of people. So you don't you don't do it on the basis of geography. So like in the in the physical area sense, you did it, do it on the basis of some number of people enclosed in an area. Right, but even if we say okay, the density is the same, the uh, demographic of people, electorate to electorate, is quite different. Yes, well, that's going to be the next point, actually. Oh, it's going to be complicated. You can make this as complicated as you like. I don't think that making it incredibly complicated is necessarily beneficial well, but no, there is I a st- yeah yeah but there is a statistical argument if you wish to have a demographic representation of your population for how you would do this which is different to what you would do if you want kind of a fair representation and this she made air quotes yeah <laughs> you could probably hear that but she did it yeah 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 just as you can stratify a sample based on geography or number of people you can stratify based on demography Okay, now to go back to the buckets yep. uh, explanation, what does this look like if you want to do multiple stratifications? Multiple stratifications in terms of buckets. Okay, so let's say we want to have our electorate buckets, and within each electorate bucket, we want to stratify based on something else. So let's say we're going to have our men, women, and non binary people. Mm-hmm. So for a given electorate, you would have three buckets men, women, non binary people. Okay, I'm seeing now that you would get uh, many buckets. We're talking about many buckets. This so- is why it gets very complicated. And this this system of doing uh, sampling has been set up for statisticians who are trying to make the best estimates they can about statistical properties of populations. This is not the same as an effort to give a equitable distribution of political power. Yeah, and obviously, if you don't do this, you risk some people being marginalised. If you do do this, you risk some people mar- being marginalised. I think the reason you do it is that you're you're taking a less... You're trying to lessen where that occurs. Yeah, yeah. So what are the... One of the ar- problems with Dean's law is that if your population 
if your if your population air quotes is tiny enough in terms of your particular you'll never be selected yeah demographic uh, interest one of the arguments for having a stratified sample on the basis of demographics is that you could use it to even out the demographic distribution of an electoral system. Right. So if your parliament is dominated by your cis, rich, white, het dudes, you can say, well, we're going to have a smaller number of that in our stratified sample. That is so fraught. I know. Yeah, yeah. This is why I don't think it's necessarily a good idea. It's hard to understand. It literally introduces a bias, not in a, like, oh my god, that's bad way automatically, but in a statistical sense that you have a skewed outcome towards some groups, right? I don't think it's a good way to go, but you can do it. I mean, yeah, absolutely. You want representation of people who aren't rich, white, cis dudes, but if you had a mechanism to turn down certain demographics... Well, also, even if you just take a simple random sample, that is going to based on demographics alone, not be over full of cishet white dudes. Yeah, yeah, no, I, like, I, I follow. I just, my wariness is, is of, don't don't invent the gun and assume it's going to be pointed at... Yeah, 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 absolutely. Who... I do not think that stratified sample based on demography would be a particularly good idea. Okay. I do think that if you are going to have this alongside an electoral system, using electorates as a geographic stratification, I don't think that's necessarily a bad idea. It's, they're not perfect, right? There is no perfect solution here. Right. It's all a question of, well, what's the compromise you think is best? Yeah, no, in the same way that I was saying that, you know, the, the Dean's Law mandatory sampling yeah, yeah. Is, is not necessarily flawless. It's just the, you know, the least flawed. Do we have a third? Have we got simple and stratified? We got, we got number well, three? Yes, yeah, so this is what I would call a weighted sample. Ooh, this sample been working out. Oh, yeah. yeah. This sample's buff. Whereas in a stratified sample, you have your separate buckets and you say we're going to take some number of from, from each. You specify how many you'll take from each ahead of time. In a weighted sample, you say, okay, we're going to say that this characteristic will make these people more likely to be se- selected. Mm. This is the most kind of mathematically complicated way to go because explaining how that weighting works what determines those thresholds and that's really hard like the arithmetic is annoying you have to do it in a computer it's hard to point and show somebody what's going on but it is somewhat less fraught than having a stratified sample in the sense that you don't specify how many you'll get from a given group you just have the random selection so it is more likely that you will get more from one group than another. Again, I think this runs into exactly the same problems of questions of bias. Yeah, yeah. Because a weighted sample is similar to a stratified sample, by definition biased. So let's say you take the simple, simple random sample without replacement. Yes. That, as we discussed, has a problem that you might get the great Newcastle Forum of, of 2068 or whatever I said. Yeah. Is that problem that we discussed that you might get sort of a representative clumps? Mm. Is that less of a problem than issues you might get of abuse of the stratifying or weighting of a sample? This is why I think you may have noticed I'm generally in favor of the like electoral thing. Yeah, yeah. Like, I think that the clumping can be avoided by having the stratified sample on geographic in the geography. Yeah. And that is a very clear, very simple, very transparent way to ensure that structure. Everything else gets more complicated, is less transparent, is harder to understand, has additional barriers to buy in. Yeah, and I don't I mean I don't want to, to sort of indulge in the, the liberal idea that if you just make a system good enough it's it's no, I, I th- for an abuse. But well no, I think weighted samples and demographically stratified samples are prone to abuse. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. They're all they're all prone to problems. It's just you're picking the yeah the, the best one. I just don't I guess understand them well enough. To me, I, I'm a huge fan of simplicity. Yeah. Well, the, the simple random sample without replacement. I mean, with or without replacement in a large enough population, like... Dean's pretty, Yeah, pretty pretty hard to select the same person twice if right. it's one in 25 million, right? Mm. But you would do a simple random sample without replacement just because you don't want to have to fuck around with that, basically. Yeah. That's, that would be my reason of doing it. It's, yeah. And it's very easy to explain to people. It's literally you yeah. all know the big, the big pen and teller um, <laughs> numbered ball. Put that in. Put that in the slideshow. The picture of me on the pen and teller. Where I'm looking all right. at all the balls. I'll, I'll have it flash up here while we're talking about this. Fantastic. i got to find the photo, though. Their show was fantastic. It was great. I got to go up there and look at their thing, and then they, they cheated because they're magicians. <laughs> How do you stop... What is this, uh, the statistical defense against magicians in this system? 
You don't have them running your electoral system. All right, kill Penn and Teller on sight. It's an official, <laughs> uh, statistically insignificant policy. Well, no, look, I'm, I would trust magicians more than like somebody who claims to be actually doing like miracles. Oh, oh. Because a magician, you know they are fooling you. They tell you they are fooling you. That's true. You just have to work out how. They're very honest in that sense. Yes. Now, i got to ask, all these three options, they all involve taking all the buckets and then drawing all the pe- people out at once. Well, you know, you've only got so many hands. Yeah. But I'm thinking, like, because I, uh, I play a little, little tabletop mm-hmm. gaming, which is that particular instances of randomness don't have to be simultaneous and don't have to be ignorant of each other. Oh, okay, so... Um, so is there a system where you say, we're doing this simplified random sample, we go, oh, shit, we got 30 from Newcastle. We have to stop this from happening again. Is there a way to avert that, like in some systematic fashion of saying... Yes, the stratified sample. Oh, that that involves... That's the stratified sample. No, 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 but if you, would, if you weren't... If you didn't have the geographic... Okay, so, well, at some point do you say... Okay, we need to start doing stratified sample because we're hitting a, a Newcastle criticality. In, in a simple random sample without replacement, right? Every possible combination of, let's say, 100 people from your 25 million yeah, yeah. is equally likely, right? Yeah. But let's say you've drawn 50 yeah, and you don't like where that's going. Can you change the rules mid-flight? That is a question for politics and not for statistics. I would say there, there are always ways to retake a sample, but... If you want your system to have buy-in, you do not get to do that. Okay, but but I'm not saying like just change rules on the fly in like a like seat of the pants kind of way. Let's say you get through fifty, yeah, and things are looking fucked up. You don't retake that sample. You say for this last fifty, because we've hit some officially recognized problem level. Yeah. Do we at this point, as part of the system, start drawing with a different weighting to make sure we get somebody from? Darwin. We get somebody from Perth. I would build those in at the start. Okay. Because you don't want to... It kind of breaks how you would do the sampling to go partway through and go, oh no, the sample doesn't look like what we wanted. We'll have to redo it, right? Mm -hmm. So you build a structure in at the start, however you want to do that, which would prevent those problems. Because then... It's it's not like you have to stop halfway through and go, sorry, everyone, we have to change this now. You go in knowing what the stakes are. You go in knowing what the structure is. Mm. And that is much more transparent, understandable, comprehensible than to have, if we get to 50 and they're all from the one area, here's what we'll do. It'll look like this. No, that's just complicated, over overcomplicating okay. it. Yeah. Because I don't, I don't know whether or not that's overcomplicated. Like maybe oh, yeah, yeah, it if you be. told me, it's like, oh, sorry, that's the that's the crumpsful method. <laughs> It's actually very simple. I've well, got to write an equation. So what you would be doing in that context is you would be taking multiple samples. The first one would be something like a simple random sample without replacement. And then the second one would be a weighted sample or a stratified sample to compensate for the uh, like the um, demographic problems in the first one. That's what that would look like. All right. Which you can avoid having to do that by just building some sort of structure in ahead of time, which prevents those problems happening. To my immense dissatisfaction, I have once again learned. Yeah, I know. All right, it's not well. awful. So the reality is that these systems can be as fancy as you want, and uh, statisticians who specialize in sampling theory are precisely the people you get to work on this. I am not one of those. You get experts to do this properly. But as mentioned, there are real advantages to a simple system that is easily explained to people and that can is transparent. And yeah, for all my questions, this is still easier to explain to people than ranks choice voting. <laughs> I don't necessarily agree with that, but like You're too smart to understand the average person. <laughs> I, don't, I disagree with both of those statements. Rank choice voting just rank choice voting is simple, but contain but requires holding too many things in your head at once. To understand completely. Mm. I have had people decide not to vote because I've tried to explain to them how it works. (laughs) Uh, How should I put this? I feel like you do not have the level of um, statistical education experience to do that very well. All right. Well, that's fine. I guess I'll just go put a cigarette out of my dick. Okay. <laughs> Have fun, dear. <laughs> One thing I do want to talk about and that I did mention before is that sortition is not a cure for all ills, right? If you have a marginalized group, which is also a small population, they are not going to show up in sortition unless you specifically choose for them, realistically speaking. The probability of them showing up is very low. Yeah. So this is not a cure for things like institutional racism against Indigenous people in Australia. This is not a cure for the marginalisation of small groups in the population. It will hopefully provide a greater variety of people 
access to political power because like marginalized people who are excluded from the political process through this would probably also be excluded from the political process through an electoral system. Yeah, yeah. It's, you've got to compare against what we've got. Yeah, so it's you know it's it's not perfect. It's not a cure all. And I think that like the the example of indigenous people in Australia is going to become quite important in the next couple of years in Australia as we have a huge debate over whether or not we should have an indigenous voice to parliament, which is I I think as a Maori person a distraction from the fact that. And a lot of Indigenous people have actually asked for sovereignty and a treaty with the yeah. Australian government, not a voice to parliament. So these other things need to be dealt with alongside this. But I do genuinely think that sortition can provide a more equitable society and a balancing of political power between like the people who currently hold it and the general population. It's got the quality that really good, I think, sort of political reform has, which is that even if you don't get all that other stuff, yeah, it is still an improvement. Yes. If you got sortition, even if you didn't get treaty with indigenous peoples, even if you didn't get you know sovereignty for those individuals, even if you didn't solve all these other problems, they would still have a better shot at things. Mm. And and then and then later achieving those items if sortition went through. Not that you don't try and get it. Yeah. Everything you want. I'm just saying that when you've got a, uh, it's like building a Magic the Gathering deck. <laughs> Any element. Fuck. <laughs> Any element which requires another element to function is uh, necessarily less... Stop banging the table. Oh, sorry. I'm, I'm enunciating. is less desirable than uh, an element which is individually Beneficial. Uh, if effective. Yeah. Because what if you don't draw it? What if you draw a whole bunch of mountains? Well, I mean, I don't think that this can stand alone, right? Because as I said, you need material support for the people to enable them to do this. You need education so people have better access to comprehending this stuff. Yeah. But I think if you can have this... Or, I mean, even if it's threatened at some level, that immediately brings to the table better universal healthcare in Australia, better material support for people who are struggling. Because there's a shitload more of those people than there are, you know, landlords and millionaires and whatever else. No, De Dean's Law wins here. Yes. It's it's a great way to put uh, political power, assuming that in its implementation, these people aren't just, you know, nullified. Yes, well, that's why these are the statistical questions that we care about. Yeah. What well, you care about, I don't understand them enough to really have an opinion. I don't agree with that. I just believe... You've expressed a lot of opinions about these in the last hour. I see this as a method by which we can get Scunter in the same room as Peter Dutton. <laughs> <laughs> and just making him look... You're threatening me with a good time, yeah. Precisely. Making him look at Scunter would be fantastic. <laughs> and then having Scunter suplex Peter Dutton would be absolutely incredible. And for that reason, I am um, have uncritical support for Sortition. <laughs> I have to go to the toilet. Okay. Well, thank you for coming on my podcast. Have fun wrapping up. Bye-bye. <laughs>